My name is Mary Collier. I'm the Professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you to Ask Me Anything with Irene Chalmers this morning. So we are presenting this in partnership with the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Um, so as we get started, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that Toronto, where the OMA office is, is located, <coughs> excuse me, has been the site of human activity for more than 15,000 years. The land is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat. And today, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. So thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I hope everybody's ready for a great conversation. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows how to participate today. So you will see um, slides as I have here on the screen. Um, and you'll see this panelists' faces and hear them speak. Um, if you'd like to send a question to the presenters, um, you can use the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you'd like to just say hello to the other folks in the webinar today, you can use the chat feature for that. So we'll try and keep our eyes on both of those um, just to make sure everybody's questions and comments are addressed today. Um, we are recording this webinar, so um, it can be accessible after the fact as well. So today's webinar will be one hour. We'll begin with an introduction, then I'll pass it over to our presenters. And then I'll make some quick announcements following discussion and we'll wrap up around 11 a.m. So I'd like to start by introducing today's model, moderator. Um, Madeline Smallers is the chair of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Madeline is a museum professional with a strong interest in the experiences of diverse populations in cultural spaces, particularly through the accessible and inclusive management of programs, human resources, communications, and operations. Um, and our speaker today is, of course, Irene Chalmers. Irene is an interpretive planner with over 25 years of experience in the museum and heritage field. Um, and as a freelancer, Irene has planned a wide range of museums and exhibitions for diverse clients, including the Manitoba Museum, Parks Canada, Massey Hall, and the Royal Ontario Museum. But you'll hear plenty more about Irene's career um, as we get going today. So I will pass it over to Madeline and Irene to get started. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Smolars. My pronouns are she and her. And as Mary stated, I am the chair for 2019 to 2022 uh, of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Quite a mouthful. Um, so the reason why we are doing this Ask Me Anything series is because earlier during the COVID-19 pandemic, we essentially polled our community and asked them, um, what do you need from us right now as a committee? How can we help you, meet you where you are at and support you best? And one of the things that folks asked for the most was professional development opportunities. I know right now it's um, pretty well near impossible to connect with people in person who aren't in your social circle or bubble. And so um, by having this platform available, uh, thanks very much in partnership to the Ontario Museum Association, uh, we're able to come to you in your homes, in your workplace, places wherever you are today and connect you with someone who has incredible experience and knowledge of the field. Today's person being Irene Chalmers. So thank you in advance to Irene for coming forward and, and sharing her knowledge with us today. Uh, in particular, after the success of our first session, which was back in July with Sarah Bean Borg. And you can see that session online on YouTube on the OMA's account if you wish. Um, so on behalf of the GOEMP committee, I will share our land acknowledgement statement. Um, in the spirit of the recommendations made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the GOEMP committee respectfully shares the following land acknowledgement statement on our website and on the open of our meetings and public presentations, this being one of them. So the GOEMP committee acknowledges that in what is today known as the province of Ontario, we are guests who live, work, and meet on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Atawandaran, Haudenosaunee, and Yiniwak, Kayanakahaka, Métis, Odawa, Ojibwe, Onadawaga, 
Oneida, Potawatomi, and Wendat peoples. Some territories remain unceded while others are covered by treaties and we strongly encourage our community members to learn the treaties in their regions of Turtle Island. We express deep gratitude that we are able to carry out our work as a committee on these territories and we are thankful for the land and the resources we are using in our work. We honor all of the diverse Indigenous peoples who have called these territories home since time immemorial. And I will very quickly share a slide with all of you so you know where to find the Go EMP Committee online. Um, we largely live online, it being a very big province that we live in. And here we go, I will start the presentation. There we go, it's just one slide. Um, so we do connect with people very much online, even pre-pandemic and I'm sure post-pandemic as well. So you can see our website there, www.goemp.wordpress.com. There is our email address if you would like to reach out to us. We also have a contact form on our website if you find that easier. Um, we have a very large, healthy uh, Facebook group. Um, if you search for a group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals, um, I think we're close to 1,400 members, which is incredible. Uh, not just in Ontario, but all around the world. And of course, on Twitter, you can search us with the hashtag GoEMP. If you want to connect with me um, in person afterwards, or personally, I should say, not in person, um, there is my Twitter handle, and you can certainly find me on LinkedIn as well. So I will stop sharing my screen now and get out of that presentation. Um, so I am pleased now after giving my end of the introduction to introduce all of you to Irene Chalmers, who will be giving a short introduction uh, about herself, her experiences, and just kind of situating herself as an experienced museum professional. So thank you very much, Irene. I can't wait to have this conversation with you, and please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline, and thanks, Mary, and thanks to the OMA for um, hosting us today. Um, I do have a, a brief presentation. I'll just share my screen. Um, one second. Ah. There we go. Okay. Are we good? Can you see that? Yes, it looks fabulous. Great. So uh, thank you, as I said, for having me today. I'm going to tell you uh, very briefly about how um, I got to be where I am in the museum field. I've been really fortunate to have a, an over 25 year uh, career uh, in the field and uh, still going and uh, um, really just a lot of gratitude for all the amazing experiences that I've had, but it's not been a smooth road. <laughs> it's not a smooth road for anybody I know who works in this field. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how I got started. Um, when I was uh, in high school and in my undergrad, I wanted to be many things. First, I wanted to be an archeologist. And so I got a, a BA in archeology span and um, history. And then I tried being an archeologist and I gained a tremendous amount of respect for archeologists because it's very, very hard physical labor. And I just was not cut out for it. And so um, I was lucky through my undergrad to have a part-time job as um, a museum interpreter at the Scarborough Historical Museum. Um, and it was such a positive experience that um, I thought I wanted to be a museum educator. Um, but I tried and tried to find a job after I finished my undergrad and I had a, you know, a huge stack of, of resumes that um, I, for jobs that I didn't get, applications for jobs that I didn't get. And so I um, turned to, I knew that I was a good communicator and a good writer. So I thought, well, maybe I'll do public relations. So I, I thought, okay, I'm going to work as a, as a PR professional. And I um, I started to do a certificate in, I did a certificate in public relations at Ryerson. Um, at the same time, I was doing my certificate in museum studies through the OMA um, and uh, learning a lot more about museum work, but still not having any success getting a job. But through that uh, program that I did um, at Ryerson, 
an opportunity presented itself. I um, had a, a marketing assignment and I interviewed the head of marketing at the Royal Ontario Museum and she was very helpful and kind. And then she said, you know, you know this is great, but um, you know, your background sort of makes you more suited to working in education than in, uh, in marketing. Wouldn't you like to meet the head of education here at the Royal Ontario Museum? And I said, well, yes, I, I sure would like to meet him. And, and sure enough, I, I got to meet him. And um, after a lot of phone calls and faxes, which shows you how long ago it was, um, he offered me a summer job creating discovery boxes um, in the Discovery Gallery at the Royal Ontario Museum. And these were the first boxes that I created. Um, and from there, I was actually hired as the assistant coordinator of the Discovery Gallery, uh, which is a hands-on gallery. Uh, there's a, another version of it at the Royal Ontario Museum now, but this is the basement version way back then. Um, and in that job of assistant coordinator, I had the opportunity to create my first exhibit. And this is my first exhibit. And um, it was in the basement of the Royal Ontario Museum and it was the 20th anniversary of the Discovery Gallery. And I was asked to create a little exhibit about uh, the 20th anniversary. So you can see that, you know, I, I hope that my exhibitory skills have come a long way since then, but, but um, I, I do still use a lot of quotes in every exhibit that I create. Um, and that's, that's um, this was my first one. And I, I based it on quotes by, of people who had um, been touched by the Discovery Gallery in some way. Um, eventually I got to know people at the ROM and um, I went on to do a master's um, in education because I realized that I wanted to work something with communication, with education. Um, and I started out in the museum studies program uh, at U of T doing my master's there, but they weren't able to offer the same uh, focus on, uh, on public programming and education that I wanted. And so I switched to the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, OISE, and did an MED instead. Um, and through that work, um, I, through that coursework, um, I got to do an internship at the ROM. And then eventually I was invited to create these um, uh, educates. These are like a little museum exhibit in a box that the ROM uh, loans out to schools all over the province. And the museum had just gotten a three year grant, a huge grant to create these. And I was asked to write, to be the planner, the interpretive planner for them. So I worked with a designer, um, we created um, a whole bunch of them. And all of a sudden, I was an interpretive planner. And then came the biggest opportunity of all, I was invited to bid, that was the first time that I actually bid on a project on creating the a new discovery gallery, which is the current discovery gallery at the ROM. And this is it, it still looks pretty much like that. Um, all these years later, so <laughs> it's due for a facelift, but um, it's, uh, it's quite an amazing hands-on space. And that was where um, I met uh, really my mentor in interpretive planning. And that's kind of a theme. Um, if I had to um, give you know, one piece of advice, it would be find a mentor or many mentors. Um, interpretive planning is not something you can learn. There's not a, a degree in interpretive planning. There's not even really any really detailed course that I know of. I'm sure there are, but I don't know of them and I never took one. Um, but I learned how to be an interpretive planner from Steven Spencer, who was a, a super talented interpretive planner at the ROM. And he, I did this project, but he guided me through it. Um, I wrote 70,000 words for it. And most of them are still there. <laughs> a whole chunk got taken out when the Biodiversity Gallery was built, but most of them are still there. Um, from there, you know, my personal life took a turn. I had, I had children, I had a family, I had all sorts of stuff. And so being a freelance interpretive planner really fit into that. And, uh, and that's what I still am today, uh, all these years later. So I um, work uh, on my own. I have uh, my own business, it's called Lilac Creative. And I uh, either work directly for museums or I uh, partner with um, exhibit design firms, architectural firms, uh, exhibit fabrication firms to do projects. This is a, a recent uh, project that I was really privileged to work on uh, an aviation museum in Winnipeg. Uh, and I worked with the uh, design firm Reich and Petch, um, with whom I've had a lot of uh, really great projects. 
I'm also a visitor advocate, so people, most people don't know what an interpretive planner is. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the writer and the story planner on the project, but I'm also the person who speaks for the visitor. So um, I try, I have to have a good understanding of how visitors learn in spaces, how visitors experience exhibit, exhibit spaces, and I try to be the visitor voice on the exhibition team. And primarily, I'm a storyteller. So um, I always like to say that I know a little bit about a lot of things because I tell so many different stories that I know nothing about. Um, but I think this um, uh, you know, positions me well in my role because when I don't know something about a particular topic, um, I can help the content expert to narrow it down into a story instead of just a whole slew of facts and information. I'm also a team member. So one of the richest part of uh, elements of my work is getting to meet really diverse teams all over the world. So these are, um, this is in Winnipeg for the Aviation Museum. This is the team that we worked with. There was people with all sorts of different types of experience, really, really fascinating. And I'm always privileged to meet so many different kinds of people because I work on different kinds of projects. Um, I get to work closely with very, very talented museum folks. This is um, one of my favorite teams. I worked on the uh, a Dutch paintings exhibition that was at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, two years ago. And uh, this was, these are just two members of uh, one of my, the best teams that I've ever worked on. Um, I also get to go behind the scenes. Um, these are exhibitions in progress. That's the ceiling of Massey Hall in Toronto, which I got to touch. <laughs> It was an amazing experience. Um, a picture of a moon rock in my hand. Um, in the lower right is uh, the installation of a, a, a tiny jewel box uh, exhibit of toy soldiers at the Royal Ontario Museum. So all sorts of fascinating experiences. Um, I visit as many museums as I possibly can. Um, I still love museums all these years later. I'm not sick of them yet. <laughs> And um, I find that I learn something from every single museum that I go to. Mainly, I make many, many, many bubble diagrams. I spend a great deal of my time uh, mapping out stories and uh, figuring out how different aspects of stories can blend together. Um, and these kind of story bubbles eventually become uh, space diagrams working with together with des designers. Um, and one of the most rewarding aspects of my work and, and sort of where I'm focusing right now is that I'm also a teacher. So um, I have throughout my whole career taught. I, I used to teach for uh, the OMA Certificate in Museum Studies. I taught the Exhibit Planning and Design course uh, for uh, a number of years. Uh, a lot of workshops developed um, exhibit planning curricula and now I'm teaching in the um, at Centennial College in the Museum and Cultural Management Program. So um, I'm really privileged to, to do that. That's, that's an amazing opportunity to share, but also learn uh, from uh, emerging professionals in our field. Um, people ask me for my advice a lot, and um, I think this sort of sums it up. I would say um, if you're wanting to enter this field or if you're in the early part of your career, don't try to carve a path or to shape your destiny. This is a, a narrow, quirky, wonderful field. It's not kind of your normal sort of uh, workplace. Um, and it's the most important thing is just to be alert to opportunities um, and to follow them uh, like I did uh, with an open heart and always a really curious mind. Um, so that's, that's sort of a little bit about me. And I know Madeline that you have a lot of questions uh, that have been piling up. So I'll, uh, I'll let you get started with those. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, Irene. You've actually already started to answer a couple of the questions that we received from the community, which I suspected would happen. Um, the first being, you know, someone wanted to know how you got your start um, in the work that you do now. And as well, someone was asking for general advice for folks wishing to have a career in the museum world. So that was a really good note to end on and uh, hopefully those two question askers are, um, are happy with those responses. I just think it's incredible how you literally worked your way physically up from starting in a basement <laughs> um, 
to being, you know, someone who's uh, working at all floors of the museum. So that's a very literal journey and I think very appropriate for um, someone in museum work, kind of working right from the bottom at the get-go um, all the way up. So congratulations on um, your fantastic career thus far and for sharing your knowledge both here and as a, a course instructor. I think that's incredibly important and something that you and I did discuss when we first uh, started talking about this session. So I will uh, get us started off with the questions that we've received. Uh, thank you to everybody who submitted them. There's a large number here, so I'm going to package them as best as I can. Uh, we'll first be starting to talk about um, education pathways because some folks had questions about that. Um, then we will move on to questions uh, regarding Irene's career in interpretive planning, as well as working as a consultant and being self-employed. Um, there was a question or two just about general museum things. And then we will uh, finish off with uh, getting started as a museum professional to wrap up on that note. So if you were hoping to ask questions through the Q&A during the session, uh, you can kind of keep those themes in mind, but feel free to ask your questions whenever they pop into your head. So we will get started with our first question here. Um, somebody was asking, uh, is your certificate in creative writing helpful in your work? And if so, in what way? So they must have uh, sought you out on the internet and saw that you had that certificate. So um, please feel free to answer that question. Sure, that's, some, that's something I did more recently. Um, and I, yes, I did a certificate in creative writing at Humber College. Um, and I actually did that unrelated to my work. I was, I was, I am trying to write a novel. Um, and I thought that that would help me and it has helped me. It was amazing. But I have been surprised to find that it actually has helped my work immeasurably because, um, you know, what I do is, is, is communications, but it's also creative. And so I think any kind of, if you're doing any kind of creative work, any, other program or course or experience that kind of fosters creativity and spurs your creativity is helpful, even if it's unrelated, even if it's music, even if it's uh, visual art or something else. Um, so yes, I did find it helpful. Definitely, um, you know, as I get on in my career and I, and I am um, a little less nervous about kind of putting myself out there, I noticed that I use much more descriptive language in my writing uh, when I write labels or wall panels. I go a little bit out there with language and words. I put some pretty sometimes impactful, powerful words because, you know, um, I don't know if you know, but like when, when we work on exhibits, we have very uh, big uh, limits of word counts that we can use. To, um, uh, it's, it's my job to work with a designer to create a hierarchy for an exhibition or a gallery. So we say that this level of text is going to have uh, 75 words and this other level is going to have 100 words and this label is only going to be 15 words. So um, the more I do that um, and the more there's a concision requirement, the more I have to choose my words really carefully. And yes, that certificate in creative writing has helped me a lot to be a little bolder about the types of words that I choose and the type of imagery that I create uh, in the labels that I write. That's fantastic. Congratulations on getting going with the novel. That's incredible. Quite a few, my goodness. A successful story. <laughs> <laughs> That's very exciting. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you for diving into that. And uh, there's another question uh, with respect to um, your education background. And this person is also considering doing a master's of education. Um, they know that there are different pathways that can be taken in the um, ed streams, uh, such as adult education and educational leadership. They were wondering um, which of those pathways that are out there um, did you take? And overall, would you recommend getting a um, M.Ed.? Okay, so when I did my master's and I uh, graduated in 90, 1999, um, so a long time ago, uh, there was at OISE at U of T a program called Learning in Non-School Environments. Um, so 
that was perfect. It was, this is exactly what we do in museums. We learn in non-school environments. Um, so it was about inform, informal learning or um, more recently it's called free choice learning. So learning that you do by choice, not learning that you're forced to do. Um, and what about these non-school environments um, can really stimulate learning in ways that school environments cannot or do not. Um, so it, there was all sorts of really amazing courses in that program. Like there was a course that was just all about creativity. Like it was just all about kind of creativity in the mind. Um, there was a global education course that was a requirement. Um, so there was a lot of really interesting courses. And then I was able, because I was already working um, in the Discovery Gallery at the Royal Ontario Museum, I was able to do all my courses. Um, all my uh, assignments were related to my work. Um, so I learned a lot about my, you know, museums as well. That program does not exist at OISE anymore. And I honestly don't know if there are other programs uh, like that at other faculties of education. However, I can say that um, I find what I learned even outside. So there was the core courses in the non-school environments program. And then there was other courses that you could take. So I took general courses in adult education, like you said, uh, general courses in curriculum development. All, every single bit that I learned is super useful. Um, I honestly can't even think of a single course that I took that was a waste of time, which, you know, is not everybody can say that. Um, so I highly recommend an MED as a as a preparation for museum work and obviously not if you want to work in collections management or conservation or more of the behind the scenes but if you want to work with the public yeah it's it's a really really useful degree also um, most people who are doing that program are teachers there are teachers who often who want to either improve their teaching or who want to become principals because to be a principal you have to have the master's degree and so you can really get to know teachers they're your classmates right so if you're going to be working towards developing um, educational programs, then now you understand how the teachers are approaching and the tools that the teachers have to approach um, so that you can approach them using the language that they are comfortable with. Uh, so yes, I have found every single bit of that master's uh, useful. I really recommend it as a good preparation if you wanna work in any part of the public facing areas of museums. Wonderful. Thank you. I remember when we were first speaking, um, we were talking about kind of getting started in the museum field and how a lot of the entryways into museum work are um, education related. And so you may be working with school groups, you may be working at front of house giving tours and often in those getting started museum jobs, um, getting your foot in the door, there is an education component. So um, yeah, certainly in MED, I've met other museum professionals who have earned one. And I think, um, yeah, if you want to work in those areas, it would be incredibly helpful. So thank you for that. Now, um, the next question and the last one kind of on this theme on getting started on education pathways. Uh, this person says that they are strongly considering a career in our field, in the museum field, in their late 30s. And they were wondering if there was a program that you recommended in particular. Um, I will share um, before you answer, if there's anybody curious about different museum programs, uh, museum studies programs in Ontario, uh, the GoEMP committee's website, specifically the resources page uh, near the bottom, has a listing um, in no particular order. I think it's alphabetical. Um, they're not ranked in any way of all of the museum studies programs that we're aware of and links to those so you can investigate them on your own time uh, throughout the province of Ontario. So if you kind of need a one-stop shop, so to speak, of where to look at a whole bunch at once, there is a listing there. Um, but this person uh, was asking for, for your opinion, Irene, so please go ahead. Well, I think that the OMA certificate is, is, is really the, you know, a, a really good start um, because it's, um, they are uh, short courses that are offered throughout the year. You can completely be working in a job while you take them. So it's not something that you have to dedicate a whole year of your life to. Um, and I think that that dovetails with my other, you know, number one advice that I always give, which is to work like get a job, 
best best entryway is to be working. So if you can be uh, learning, taking courses while you work, that's the very, very best thing, right? Because um, I've been in positions of a lot of hiring. I had, I didn't talk about it in my little presentation, but in the middle of all that, I spent four years as the manager of public relations at the um, Ontario legislature. And I got to hire uh, a whole bunch of staff to come and work um, uh, doing tours of the and educational programs at the uh, at the at Queen's Park at the legislature. So um, I found that when I was doing all that hiring, um, the thing that most uh, predicted success of an employee was if they had had a lot of um, work experience. And that work experience didn't have to be in museums. It could be in retail. It could be in food services. It just meant that they were familiar with a wide range of publics and understood people and how to deal with people. Um, so I always tell people, um, you know, don't spend five years in school, just start working. But if you can take some courses on the side, and that's why I think the OMA program is so uh, valuable and useful because you can be working and gaining work experience at the same time that you're learning. So I, that, that would be my answer is, especially um, if you're starting, you know, kind of later in your life entering this career, um, right now, unfortunately, because of COVID, those courses, I believe Mary can confirm, but they're being offered online. But usually, and hopefully again in the future, they are in-person courses where you go somewhere around Ontario for a few days. And so it also has the benefit of really great networking. So I actually did that certificate um, 25, like many, 30, I don't know, a lot, a lot of years ago. Um, and uh, I'm sure it just improves, improves over time. So that's, that's my recommendation. Thank you. I can see Mary dropping some links in the chat. So folks, feel free to check those out. Uh, I actually, one of my colleagues at the City of Kingston Cultural Services Department was working away at some OMA courses while working as a program coordinator. So that's a really excellent answer. And um, Mary says, thanks for the shout out, Irene, lovely. Um, it is a wonderful option because as Irene said, um, often the, the best way to get started is to to, to try to start to work or volunteer. Um, and yeah, those courses can fit in really nicely into that sort of beginning. Um, now we're going to move on to questions about your experience uh, as an interpretive planner and someone being self-employed as a consultant. So first, um, somebody wanted to know if there are differences in how you approach projects with exhibit design firms versus how you work with museums. Now, I know that there are cases where these things may overlap. You may be working with a museum and a design firm. Um, so perhaps if you could dive into the, the nuances of um, working with those two, two different bodies in your work. Sure. Um, yeah, they don't, they don't tend to overlap. So I either am hired by a museum directly and I become a part of their internal team, or I'm hired by a design firm and we are an entire external team that is going to be doing the project. So um, they are really, really different. I approach the, the, the project the same in that, uh, you know, the exhibit, I have a, a process and, um, and, you know, that doesn't change. But the way of working is very, very different for sure. So uh, when I work with a museum directly, I have to integrate myself into an existing project team. So these people work together all the time and they see each other every day and maybe they go out for drinks and maybe they know each other's spouses and children. So it's, 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 uh, it's tricky. You know, you have to integrate yourself into an existing little web with all the dysfunctions that go along with museums and, and functions as well. Um, so those are challenges, but I think I've become, you know, good at that. Um, and then the other uh, projects, when I work with a design firm, um, we are a whole external team that might come together in different ways. Um, design firms have a number of different designers, a number of different project managers, and uh, the project lead will put the team together according to the needs of that project and the availability of the people. Um, so it's always like a brand new team. Everything's brand new. Um, 
and the client group will put together some their own little kind of committee or team and they're entirely so everything's a little bit new um, and everything's fresher so it's a little bit more I have to say like efficient <laughs> because everyone's just there to kind of you know do the job and you don't need to do the whole social going for drinks and having baby showers and all the things that people who work within the museum do. So there are two very different. I would say there's efficiencies in, in, in working with a design firm and going in and just doing a, the project and then, um, you know, having clear deliverables and leaving. And it can be a little slower when I work with uh, a museum directly. Having said that, I've been fortunate to work with one or two museums consistently for a long time. And so I have formed some of those friendships as well, even though I'm always this external person coming in. And so that smooths the way as well. Um, so yeah, two, two slightly different ways of approaching, uh, mainly in terms of how the teams form. But the actual museum work of creating the exhibitions, creating the galleries, the interpretive planning work, that, that remains consistent. Wonderful. Thank you for that. We've had a couple of questions come through the Q&A, so I'm going to slot them in here. Um, Amber was wondering, in general, I know it's it can be very nuanced uh, depending on the project, but she was wondering in general, what is your process for starting to um, approach an interpretive planning project. I know you were talking about those awesome bubbles and thank you for showing examples on the screen of what that looks like. Um, but maybe if you could speak for a minute about perhaps your process around getting started on a project. Sure. Um, yeah, start with those bubbles. <laughs> so the bubble diagrams are the beginning of everything. Um, so interpretive planning is is uh, uh, at the beginning of a whole process. So uh, uh, an exhibition planning has a whole bunch of different phases. Um, and the first phase is the concept phase. So you're just developing a concept and the interpretive planning starts right at the very, very beginning. Um, and then we go right kind of to the middle. And then once um, kind of detailed design and fabrication starts, then the interpretive planner kind of pulls out and other people take over the project. So, so my work always happens near the beginning, um, which is really exciting because um, you, get, you, you get to shape it. So those little bubbles that I showed you are where you take a, a chaos of story, there's tons of story, and then you just distill it and you distill it and you still it and you try to find the nuggets. What are the most salient pieces of these stories? Which are the parts that will resonate? Um, and a little bit is educated guesses, a little bit is gut feeling, and a little bit is, um, actually Sarah Bean Borg said this in her, when you asked her questions in her Ask Me Anything, and it's exactly what I do too, is you speak to the content experts, the curator, um, or it's not always a curator, um, and you ask them to tell you about the topic or you ask them to write outlines and after you do it a few times you see a few parts of the story that crystallize that uh, really stand out and so those are the parts that become those big bubbles that you saw in my bubble diagrams um, and then my job is to find out how those bubbles can work together to tell the big part of the story and very early on to start working with designers um, and the space and trying to map those bubbles onto the space. Um, so it's a it's a really interesting exercise and it's amazing to see how those story bubbles end up sometimes not always actually dictating the way the space lays out when you finally build the exhibition or the museum. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know that question, you could probably talk all day about it, <laughs> considering your, the depth of your experience. <laughs> about that, for sure. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Amber, for asking that question. Uh, we're going to bridge talking about uh, specifically interpretive planning and kind of being a consultant and being self-employed um, with the question that someone asked, which is, what part of your job um, over the years perhaps has surprised you the most and that could be you know as someone who's self-employed as an interpretive planner um, but what has really surprised and struck you about your your work well oh, that's a really good question I actually have to think about that um, what has surprised me the most honestly I think that the projects keep 
coming. <laughs> Every time I do a project that is just really amazing, I think, wow, it cannot get any better than this, like to have had this opportunity in my life. Um, and then something else phenomenal will come up. And I think that just speaks to the vibrancy of our field, to how um, amazing museums are and how there is never an end to the um, the topics that we can explore and the 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 amazing media that we have at our at hand uh, to explore them. So I, you know, for example, I had um, a few years ago, I mentioned I worked on the Dutch paintings exhibit. Well, I'm, I have not gotten ever to work with with fine art because I, um, there's sort of like museum interpretive planners and art gallery interpret interpretive planners and kind of never the twain shall meet. Like they, you, as a museum person, you don't really get hired in art galleries to do interpretive planning. And, and, and sometimes from art galleries, you can come to museums, but not really the other way around. Um, anyway, I had never gotten to work with fine art. And then I found myself standing right beside the crate when they pulled out the Rembrandt and I, could not touch it, was not allowed, but I could see it and breathe it and be right near it. And that was an amazing, and I thought it could not get any better than that. And then I had an opportunity to work um, on a Holocaust museum. And uh, I am Jewish, so it's a story that has touched my family, that is very close to my heart. And I got to be on the ground floor of creating, developing from scratch a Holocaust museum. I thought it could not get any deeper or more profound than that. And then I got to touch the ceiling of Massey Hall. And then I got, you know, there's all these just always amazing uh, experiences. And I think that's what surprises me is how, how rich our field is and how varied the opportunities. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My goodness, I would love to see your full CV. Like it must be several pages long at this point. <laughs> um, thank you very much for speaking about that. Uh, we'll kind of angle a little bit more towards self-employment now um, and consulting. Um, somebody was looking to perhaps get started with their own consulting business and they shared they're in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is incredible. Um, so it shows that the OMA and our programming reaches across Canada. So thanks for this question. This person doesn't quite know where to start with uh, their own consulting business. And so they were wondering if you had any advice or resources for someone uh, just starting out. And as well, I'll kind of couple this with another question. Um, perhaps if you could speak about um, where self-employment and consulting may be headed in the next couple of years, because that could help this person out as well. Sure. Um, well, it depends really what area of consulting she wants to do. Um, so I don't know if you want to be like a freelance conservator or, um, uh, you know, or uh, exhibit planner or if you're a designer. So it a little bit depends on, 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 on the field. There may be some kind of specialized uh, association that you can belong to or something that I, I don't know about. I don't, I don't know about exactly about all the all the fields, but I would say that a general word of advice would be to talk to um, other consultants in your city. So it sounds a little counterintuitive because um, they will be your competitors and it is really competitive. So bidding on the few jobs that there are um, becomes competitive. And, and um, so, you know, people, you may think that why would you want to talk to them, but but you do. You you want to know what other consultants are doing, how they approach their work, how much work is there, um, and is it worthwhile really starting your own consultancy when maybe you can just partner with an exist, existing consultancy that's already um, plugged into um, all the RFP networks. So there's like places where you can get when you can find out who is. Um, uh, who has a request for proposals out, who is looking to hire um, a consultant. So, you know, that, I would say that the best place to start is start by talking to other consultants who do what you want to do and determine whether it's, there's really room for you to create a new consultancy or whether perhaps there's opportunities to partner with them. So that's, that would be a first step. And then beyond that, um, make sure that you're connecting with the community. So go to conferences, I mean, now they're online, but even online, go to conferences, uh, do as many networking uh, uh, kind of events as you as you can. 
that's fine. Oh, and then, and then part two, what is the future of consulting? I don't know. This is like the, <laughs> you know, like what is the future of museums? I mean, we don't, you know, you need a crystal ball. We don't know. But what it feels like to me is that, um, you know, with so many museum folks laid off, um, I think it'll be harder in the next little while to um, build, to create as many new exhibitions um, as possible, to build as many new, or, or as we did before, to build as many new museums as were being built to, to and, and, and again, I stress that all of those many exhibits and all of those many museums were already fairly few in the grand scheme of the world, right? We're not creating like new iPhones or new, you know, things in, in, in huge scale. Our, the, the scale of our field is, is relatively small, but um, I think that will shrink. Um, and so the opportunities for consulting may shrink and may become more competitive. Um, at the same time, I think there's an opportunity there for younger people to enter the consulting world because you will be charging a lower fee than those of us who have been already doing this for 25 years. And so if those fees shrink, but the work is still needed, you are better positioned for that work. Um, so I, I think the opportunities are there. I think we need another kind of year or so to see how this all, you know, how this all shakes out. Thank you. We're definitely at a point in time that feels like a turning point because things are um, changing so rapidly in the world and then we're also dealing with um, a global pandemic. So there's a lot of different moving pieces to keep in mind moving forward. So thank you for using the experience you do have and um, to, to kind of, I know it's difficult to predict, as you said, you need a crystal ball to um, come even close to seeing what it might be like, and that's just not possible. But thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I will uh, get just briefly um, have a moment to touch upon a question that somebody asked a little bit about the future of museums. Um, about whether it's profitable to move your museum um, online, make it virtual for free. Um, this is something that you and I had briefly spoken about and um, neither of us have much experience in that. And so I just wanna take a moment to encourage anybody who's interested in um, virtual museums or um, doing any sort of digital work to, like you said, with respect to consulting, speak to people who are already doing it. Um, so for example, the folks at the Bytown Museum have, uh, in Ottawa, have brought a lot of their um, offerings online. I know that they have like a 3D digital tour. Um, so if you are curious about any kind of museum work, honestly, um, it definitely pays to speak to the people who are who are working on the ground and are at the forefront of those changes in museum work as well. Now we are getting towards the end of our time, so we're going to wrap up with a couple of um, comments about what it's like getting started as a museum professional in general. So I will try and couple uh, these questions together so you can offer some final remarks uh, before we leave for the day. I can't believe it's gone by this quickly. Um, Somebody asked, what is one thing you would say to museum study students who have started in their programs this month? And I guess, you know, as an instructor yourself, perhaps you could share some words that you shared with your students already. Sure, yeah, we just uh, started our course this last week. Um, and um, I think what I did say and what I would say is, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, this is a, a, an exciting field. It's a, a, it's a little bit of a wild uh, and uh, unpredictable field. Um, but the mo I think the most important thing is to be positive and, and like I said in my introduction, I'm open, really open. Um, I have seen in the past a lot of my students um, be frustrated that they don't like any of the jobs that are available. This was like in the pre-COVID days, so I think they would maybe not say that now, but um, you know, they would, I would point them, they were coming towards the end of their program and I would point them to all these uh, spring job postings that were coming up uh, and they would just say, yeah, I don't wanna do any of that. None of that appeals to me. 
Um, and I would, I, I said to them, and I say to my students now, and I, I say to this um, per asker of the question, uh, you have to be open. Um, this is not a, a field that you can uh, succeed in if you have uh, a really narrow uh, vision for what you want, because it just doesn't, it just doesn't play out that way. You have to be open to opportunities, open to different pathways, um, open to alternative views and ways of doing things. Um, and so just be, be, be present, be open, uh, be positive, and uh, see where it takes you. Thank you. Somebody did um, specifically ask about the Centennial program which you are teaching in, and they were wondering um, if you could just give like a, a little bit of detail about um, what what it offers students who are, are just starting out. Um, they've been looking around at different programs and wondering how to get started um, because they're just trying to learn more about the field and um, are thinking about getting their feet wet with a program. Sure. Um, the Centennial program, it's called Museum and Cultural Management. It's a, it's a, a one year, two semester program. So it's really only eight months. Um, right now it's uh, completely online. Um, so we have our classes here is almost twice what it normally is. Uh, and perhaps that's because it's online and it's a little bit easier for people to access. I know that we have students, uh, we have a student uh, in Germany, we have students all over Canada. So people are, are taking this course from all over the place. I don't know that that's gonna be available after this year, but that's what's happening this year. Um, but it's, a, it's an overview um, uh, postgraduate certificate. So you need to already have uh, your undergrad degree, um, although a lot of students have masters uh, as well, but it's, it's not at all required. Um, and it's, a, it's an overview. So you get some collections management, you get some conservation, you get um, some uh, project management. Uh, I teach a course called Programming Interpretation. Um, there's an overview, uh, sort of how to be a museum professional course. Um, but the best thing about it is that it has not just one, but two practical components. So I would say that if you're surveying museum programs and you're trying to pick which one to do, make sure you pick one that has a practicum component. So um, the Centennial program has both an internship as well as um, a course that is uh, a community project. So you're actually going to do a museum project for the community. So it might be an exhibition, it might be a publication, it might be uh, something online, all different kinds of programs. And, that, and that's happening this year, even with COVID, there's gonna be um, uh, online kind of, I'm not quite sure how it's going to work, but it but it will still happen. So um, yeah, this is a, a very strong program because um, the program coordinator, uh, Phaedra Livingstone, has managed to pull together uh, a really strong faculty. So the faculty is made up of um, working highly experienced professionals from the City of Toronto, uh, from the Royal Ontario Museum, um, from other really experienced uh, faculty. So I. I, I'm a little partial to it, but I highly recommend it. Thank you, Irene. And thank you, Nicole, for asking that question. Hopefully that will help. Um, before we get to our final question, I did want to briefly address a question that came through uh, from a recent OMA grad who shared that they are over 50 years old and they're not eligible for some of those starting jobs for students, such as the Young Canada Works program. Um, and they were asking, what do you recommend to get a job in this sector? And um, I thought it was really important. I felt it was important to touch upon this briefly before we close today, because there may be some emerging museum professionals out there um, who are on the older side in terms of age, but an emerging museum professional can be anybody just getting started. So you and I, Irene, discussed this a little bit. And I think what we both felt this person should hear is um, 
you know, the most successful workplaces are those that are multi-generational. You know, museums serve multi-generational publics, and uh, a workplace is stronger because of the different voices um, of the people working behind the scenes and at front of house as well. So um, whoever you are, question asker, please don't be discouraged. And really, that goes for anybody. Whatever background you come from, um, those are your strengths. And it makes for a more diverse, successful workplace and museum. Um, um, so I just wanted to, to take a moment to recognize that question and to just be very encouraging. Um, don't be disheartened because you may not be able to apply for YCW. There are certainly things out there for you. Um, and use your experiences and your age um, to your advantage. You've got a lot to offer. So the final thing that um, we will finish with before Mary does her wrap up is um, in general, looking at uh, the museum field where we're at right now, um, folks are wondering um, what ways can they continue to explore, network, get started? Do you have any general advice for this moment in time um, for people who are maybe feeling a little bit worried, um, thinking, you know, not sure where they should turn next because um, of our current situation? So do you have any final words of wisdom for um, how they can put their best foot forward? I would say that um, because the opportunities are not uh, landing in our laps because we're all so distanced, um, that the onus is on you to reach out. So for example, if you, um, you know, if, if, so if you do, there's all these free things like this webinar and all sorts of great opportunities that are happening right now. Um, in fact, more than I ever remember, I feel that COVID has created so many opportunities for online course taking and uh, webinars and different things like that. If you see a speaker that you particularly, um, that particularly you know, what they do interests you or you think you would love to have a conversation with them, reach out to them. Um, we are all, this is a very generous giving field, like I, every, myself and everybody that I work with are always very happy to, to speak with, with like strangers <laughs> about what we do. Um, uh, but you're not a stranger because we have this shared, uh, you know, love for, for museums. So, um, you know, my, my contact information, I'm on LinkedIn, so I encourage all of you to find me on LinkedIn and, and connect with me and we can communicate that way. But you can also ask for my contact information from uh, Mary at the OMA and I will always be very happy to respond. And I, I will just give you a, a quick uh, example. I know we're almost out of time, but uh, there's a young woman who was um, reached out to me um, and said she wanted to learn about interpretive planning and uh, she had done her internship uh, at the Royal Chair Museum and we had some uh, people that we knew in common. She reached out to me. Um, we met for coffee. Uh, I was really impressed. We kept talking and she ended up uh, kind of, I sort of kind of mentored her a little bit and she is now embarking on her own freelance career uh, working with the design firm that I was working on on one of the projects that I worked on uh, doing interpretive planning so that's all because she reached out to me um, and uh, you know that happens to me quite often and I know most of my colleagues are quite often uh, meeting and chatting so just because we can't do that in person right now doesn't mean that we can't continue to connect but because the opportunities aren't just uh, presenting themselves like in-person conferences it's a little bit more onus on you to reach out uh, but uh, but please do uh, and, I, and I know that I can speak honestly on behalf of most of my uh, colleagues that that we welcome that kind of uh, personal connection. Wonderful. Thank you so much for ending on such a, an uplifting, positive note. Um, that goes for myself as well. If anybody uh, feels the need to get in touch with respect to GoDMP committee offerings after this program, I'm more than happy to hear from you. Um, so I will finish with a massive 
Thank you, Irene. Um, I'm so appreciative personally. I've learned a lot today as an EMP, and I'm sure uh, those watching and those who will watch this after will find this incredibly useful. So thank you very, very much. And I would also like to say thank you to the OMA for being all right with me doing this for a second time. Um, and I, I know that Mary has some final slides to end with. So she will be giving our conclusion today. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you both. Um, certainly on behalf of the OMA, we really we really value the, the partnership of the group of the Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee and um, being able to, you know, connect people together like this. So um, many thanks for, for your ongoing partnership. And thank you, Irene, for, for sharing all of your, your experiences and insights. Um, I think this, this, uh, this webinar itself is certainly a demonstration of that generosity of spirit of this community and connecting people and, and, uh, and providing some, some guidance or at least encouragement <laughs> um, in different ways forward. Um, so, and thank you everybody who signed in today. It was uh, wonderful to have so many people um, both submit questions in advance and then participate on the day of. Um, and before we go, just a quick reminder Speaking of wonderful online things that you can do to connect with other people and learn new things, why tomorrow is the early bird deadline for the Ontario Museum Association's first virtual conference. So that's happening um, most of the, uh, starts on October the 29th and continues through most of the month of November. So there's a really fantastic program. It's on our website, so please do go and check it out. Um, I hope that we will see you there. Um, and just uh, a note that this uh, webinar was offered free of charge as a service to the community during some very challenging times for everybody. Um, so if you're able, these are some things that you can do to help support the OMA to continue doing this work. Um, if you are already a, a member, please uh, renew your membership when you get that email prompt and you need to do so. Um, if you're not a member, please consider becoming one. Um, we'd love to have you as part of uh, this community and let you know what we're up to um, on a regular basis. Um, or consider making a donation. Um, you can do so on our website or through Canada Helps. Any little bit helps. And um, certainly even your, just your participation in these webinars um, is really what makes our sector stronger and we appreciate you being here. Um, just another shout out for our COVID-19 resources page. Um, you can access it from our homepage. It's always there. Um, we have been adding to this page for months and months now at this point. Um, but all of the previous webinars that we've presented um, since April are on this page, including the previous Ask Me Anything with Go EMP. So please do check that out. Um, and when you leave, you will be directed to a quick um, evaluation form. So we'd love to, to hear um, what you liked and what you like to see more of um, in terms of webinars and other PD. And um, there's some contact information both for us at the OMA and for Go EMP if you want to connect with them as well. So I would encourage you to do so and be part of both of these fantastic communities. So um, thank you to everybody for participating today and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.